You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Coming up on today's programme... The future of energy. We visit a nuclear fusion site after scientists make a major breakthrough in sun technology. John Kerry travels to Mexico amid tensions over a plan to increase investment in fossil fuels and limit foreign firms investing in renewable energy. Plus concerns about toxic chemicals found in Turkish landfill sites that contain UK plastic packaging. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and challenge those coming up with the solutions. We begin the show with what's being dubbed a major step in finding alternative energy solutions. Nuclear fusion uses the same process that powers the sun and could provide a near limitless electricity source that's crucial for tackling the energy crisis in the UK. Well, now scientists in Oxford working on the technology have created a record-breaking 59 megajoules of fusion energy, which could pave the way for a future of fusion. Sky's science and technology editor, Tom Clark, has more. The glow is a soup of superheated ions howling around the hollow donut-shaped reactor. Then the moment of fusion happens and ends just seconds later. If it looks a bit like science fiction, that's because until recently it was. No one has captured this much energy for this long from fusion. This is a quest. It matters so much to find a sustainable form of energy for, for the planet. And over the last few years, we've had a bunch of hurdles, challenges that we've had to overcome. The, the results today show that we can do that and we can overcome all those hurdles, those challenges. That's why it's so important to us. Fusion's potential is huge. It's the process that powers our sun. Its fuel is in limitless supply. And unlike nuclear fission that runs conventional nuclear plants, there's no long-lived waste. With nuclear fission, atoms of radioactive metal split, releasing energy in the form of heat. In nuclear fusion, two different forms of hydrogen fuse together, making helium. But fusion releases four times more energy than nuclear fission. This is the engineering model of the inside of the jet machine. The temperature needed to make fusion happen is 10 times hotter than the sun, 150 million degrees. So when this thing is running, it's the hottest thing in the solar system. So nuclear fusion does have the potential to transform civilization, but the practical realities of making it happen here on Earth are enormous. Here at JET, for example, they must use more energy to achieve fusion than they get from it. But it's proven the science and is developing the tools like precision robotic handling needed for the next fusion machine, nearing completion in the south of France. These results help us to go to the next step and prove that fusion can be a power plant for the world. The ITER machine, say fusion scientists, is the final step before a commercial reactor. Only commitment stands in the way. We have shown them that this can work from an engineering point of view, from a physics point of view. The challenge is there. They cannot hide. But we've shown them that this is possible. Now, take it up and take it seriously. The truth remains, fusion power won't be with us for decades. Too late for the current climate crisis. But given a fusion reactor makes four million times more energy per gram of fuel than coal, oil or gas, its potential to create a brighter future is just too great to ignore. Tom Clark, Sky News, Oxfordshire. The United States Special Envoy John Kerry arrives in Mexico tonight to find ways for the two countries to coordinate on climate-related issues. Now, Mexico has been criticised for limiting private and foreign firms that invest in renewable energy, favouring its state-owned electricity company, while also increasing investment in fossil fuels. The United States is prepared to be as helpful as we can be, not, not because it advantages us, but because we are all in this together. No one country can solve the climate crisis. Well, let's bring in our US correspondent, Mark Stone, now. And Mark, what's behind this meeting then? Well, look, I mean, this is another uh, signal, perhaps, and we've seen others, uh, haven't we, of, of the commitments and the pledges made in Glasgow uh, a few months ago, beginning to unravel uh, domestically around the world, countries which made big, big pledges 
uh, are now struggling um, or indeed um, f outright just forgetting the proposals and the pledges that they made. And Mexico is one of those countries. Uh, it, it's clear from what the president in Mexico has been suggesting that they want to prioritize domestic uh, power companies. Uh, and those domestic power companies are, are themselves prioritizing old, dirty energy uh, and not new, clean energy. Uh, and so as, as a um, as a world leader, uh, John Kerry in the United States wants to put pressure on its neighbor, not least because they want North America as a continent to be seen to be doing more uh, in, in the climate change fight. Uh, they are trying to put diplomatic pressure on the Mexicans to change their ways, and that's why he's there, and he'll be holding important meetings, and he will, as he suggested, be offering the Mexicans some help, uh, be it financial help uh, or technological help, to try and persuade them uh, to go more green. But, but I think, as I said, this is another example of the concerns that we are seeing around the world, where those grand pledges were made in Glasgow, and they're very difficult to keep. Mark, thank you. Now for some of the day's other climate news and Boris Johnson has dismissed calls from the Labour Party to introduce a windfall tax for oil and gas companies that have reported bumper profits. The Prime Minister told Sir Keir Starmer such a tax would clobber supplies and instead gave his backing to further exploration. What he would be doing, Mr Speaker, is hitting the energy companies at precisely the moment when we need to encourage them to go for more gas, Mr Speaker, because we need to transition now to, to cleaner fuels. A new coal-fired plant has been approved in eastern China, but the state firm in charge of the project says it'll help the region's low-carbon transition. The Zhejiang Energy Group says the new plant will be more efficient, using less coal than the national average. China's President Xi Jinping has pledged to reduce coal use in the country after 2025. New drone footage has revealed the destruction left by a cyclone in Madagascar, destroying homes and damaging crops that were just weeks away from being harvested. Cyclone Batsirai is the second tropical storm to hit Madagascar in two weeks, as the country struggles with food shortages after a prolonged drought. Experts say that extreme weather events like cyclones will become more frequent because of climate change. There could be more rare mountain hares in the Peak District than first thought, according to a new nighttime survey. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust says it's welcome news for the species, but they still face many threats, including climate change, due to less snow in the winter, making them more visible to predators. Mountain hares are native to Scotland and died out in England during the last ice age, but were reintroduced in the mid-1800s, surviving now only in the Peak District. Now, where does our waste go? Well, many of you will separate your household waste into the correct bins and do your bit for the planet. But campaigners have long claimed that some of the UK's plastic waste ends up in landfill around the world. And now a new report by Greenpeace says that UK plastic packaging has been found in dump sites in Turkey and is contaminating soil with toxic chemicals. getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day now with climate activist Michaela Loach, who joins us from Jamaica, and Tom Burke, co-founder of the E3G Think Tank. So welcome to both of you. Nice to see you both. So a huge step closer to conquering one of the biggest scientific and engineering challenges of them all. That was the statement from the chief executive of the UK Atomic Energy Agency. 
As we heard from Tom Clark, nuclear fusion is still some time away from being commercially viable, but it could, in theory, be an endless supply of emissions-free power. So, Tom Burke, are you celebrating? Is this a breakthrough that could turn our power grid green in future? It, it's a small step forward in the science uh, of very sophisticated nuclear technologies. It's not really anything that's going to help us very much with climate change, as Tom pointed out. Uh, it's some way away. It's actually been some way away for about 50 years. Um, and I think this isn't really the kind of breakthrough it's being hyped up at. The real point is, as the government's already recognized, we have to decarbonize our electricity system by 2035. So we already have to have solved all the problems of finding uh, ways to make renewable electricity and energy efficiency mean that we have secure supplies of electricity. And this won't come in till long after that. So it can't be a magic wand. Now, if it turns out to be a lot cheaper than anything else, it'll have a role to play. But I'd be very surprised if that happened. So, Michaela, decades away, potentially very expensive as well, although, as Tom says, the cost could potentially come down. But is that a reason not to invest in it for the future? Because climate change is not something that's just going to stop being a problem, even in a few decades' time. Yeah, I think that the thing is that um, we need to be investing in renewables now. And as Tom has said, um, we we have a limited amount of time um, to tackle the climate crisis now. I think that right now what we need to be thinking about is how can we invest money into energy sources that are Renew that are renewable that aren't going to have an impact on the planet, but also are replicable for other countries all over the world because this is a global crisis that requires global collaboration. And things like this um, nuclear fusion, it requires huge amounts of um, high level resources in order to happen. Um, it only will really be possible in the most rich countries all over the world, um, which would then kind of lead to more inequality. And so I think that instead we could focus on things like renewables, like solar, um, things that are replicable all over the world and things that are accessible and that also are able to be owned by the community. So then we can actually centre justice in that as well, um, because that's an important thing that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about energy sources for the future. Well, yes, and, and Tom, everyone will say, obviously, renewable sources are an excellent option when you're looking to turn the grid green. However, they will also, the, the, the criticism that often comes up is, what about when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? You need a reliable source of energy. I mean, do, do we turn to, to the, our regular nuclear plants to, to provide that, do you think? <laughs> no, and what happens when your nuclear power station isn't operating? And they're obviously not operating some of the time for routine maintenance, which you can predict, just like you can predict when the wind won't blow or the sun won't be shining. Um, but actually, about 25% of the time, they're not available in unplanned ways. So we have already got to deal with and learn how to deal with the variability, and we're getting more and more sophisticated in being able to do that as we digitize the economy and we digitize the electricity system. So I think that fear is really somewhat exaggerated. That's interesting. And, and Michaela, what about this idea, though, of investing in technologies now that we don't know what their capability is in future, but it's important to always keep the options open? I mean, to what extent can technology we don't know about now potentially answer some questions and solve some problems on climate change going ahead? I think that we all like, I think we all kind of find this technological stuff really exciting, like this idea that we could create this completely um, different and high tech world. I read a lot of sci fi, so I think I read a lot about this and um, people's imaginations around it. But I also think that that would be the case if we were investing enough in renewables already. I think that what we need to do is think like, how can we protect the planet? How can we make sure that we're all going to be okay and safe and just? And then we can think about investing in, in things that maybe aren't as certain in technologies like this. But the priority should be, let's make sure that all of us are safe. Let's make sure that we have um, energy that is accessible and that is affordable and that um, is available for everyone all over the world and that prioritizes justice and means that people can live a free life life as well. And then we can think about let's maybe like look at this more um, high tech stuff. Um, but I think that we need to think about our priorities and where we put money in that way.
OK, let's move on to our next topic, shall we? Because we all know that eating well could improve our long-term health. But a new study suggests that eating more lentils, beans and brown rice and less red meat could add more than a decade to our life. And the study published in the PLOS Medicine isn't about the environment, but, as the argument goes, eating less meat could help the planet. Uh, so, Tom, as you were saying there, th this research focuses on how a healthy diet can lengthen your life, but it happens to be very planet friendly as well, this diet that they're talking about, is it mainly because it doesn't involve any meat. So could research like this point people in the direction of, of making green lifestyle choices without them even realising it? I think that's absolutely right. And as you can imagine, anything that will extend my life by 10 years, I'm pretty interested in. <laughs> yeah, I'm up uh, for that as doing. well. As I think I think the, the the point is exactly right that this is uh, and the evidence is now becoming a more and stronger and stronger that uh, actually a light a, a diet that's light in meat is actually very good for your health so very good for you personally but it's also very good for the planet because the particularly the sort of uh, sort of mass production of uh, meat for the market actually produces not just really bad effect on climate change, but it also produces an enormous amount of pollution of water uh, and destruction of biodiversity that goes with it. So I think this kind of advice helps us to do the right thing rather than penalising us for doing the wrong thing. Yeah, and Michaela, what is the best way to, to nudge people into making greener choices? Is it a bit like this study, which wasn't designed to nudge people uh, planet-wise, but do you think if you appeal to people's self-interest, they're more likely to make changes, or do you think that underestimates people's ability to see the greater good when it comes to climate change? So I think that what's, what this study shows and what a lot of actually climate solutions show is that all of us are interconnected to the planet and to each other. Um, that us being healthy it was also healthy for the planet, that the planet being healthy is healthy for us and that there are so many co-benefits that arise when we tackle the climate crisis in a way that we're addressing all of these connections. And I think that the best way that we can get people on board with climate action is to meet people where they already are. So if you have a, a friend or an uncle who likes something already, like show them how that's connected to the climate crisis, show them how they could either like benefit from, from tackling it through that way or why what that they care about is being um, threatened by the climate crisis because all of us care about climate already. I'm, I'm sure every, that everyone, something you care about is connected to the climate crisis in some way. And we can talk about the bad stuff. We can also talk about how things can be better if we tackle um, many of these issues um, with this lens of realizing the connections. And so I think studies like this are really great because it's like, yeah, of course, um, eating less meat is better for the planet and better for our health. Um, but it's showing that there's they're all connected. And it's not just we're doing it as this selfless act. We're doing it also as a way that can help us and help the planet and help each other. But, but Tom, is the problem of talking like this about choices individuals make actually take the responsibility away from where it should lie? And that's governments and policies and those bigger decisions like building new coal fired power stations. Isn't, isn't that where we should put our focus? These are not either ors. You, you, you need both. You need certainly need government to actually play a rather more active role than it's playing, for instance, in the way we uh, uh, allow our food and agriculture policies uh, to play a better role. But actually, governments are driven at the end of the day by what their voters and what people want. And what I think is, is really important about the sort of evidence like this is it, it, it tends to encourage, in many ways, the peer pressure on people. As we saw with COVID, you know, when given the chance, most people want to do the right thing. And it's something even on COVID, the government managed to underestimate the extent to which people will do the right thing if they think everybody else is doing it. OK, we must leave it there. I can see you nodding there, Michaela, but we are out of time, I'm afraid. Tom Burke, Michaela Loach, really good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. And that's it from me. But tomorrow Bye. I'll be joined by environmental lawyer Tessa Khan and Dan Caesar, Chief Executive of Fully Charged. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.